Hello everyone, my name is Pixel Riffs, and welcome back to the Minecraft Survival Guide. I hope you're all having a good day, because I am. <laughs> I've found a bunch more diamonds down here. So, here we are once again, back at the bottom of the chunk that we've been mining out using moss, going from as far as possible up in the world at Y214, all the way down to bedrock. And right now we're standing at Y-36, which means we do not have all that long left to go before we can take a look at the contents of an entire chunk of a mountain biome to see what all is here and to compare it to the ore distribution graphic that Mojang published a while back when they changed world generation and changed ore generation for the 1.18 update. So the order of business for this episode is we're going to continue mining everything out until we are all the way down to bedrock level and then we're probably going to mine out a few of the patches of deep slate that intermingle with the bedrock down there because there might still be a chance that the occasional ore block is going to be down there in between the patches of the bedrock because bedrock doesn't generate as an even flat floor it kind of has peaks and valleys in there that might still contain ores i'm probably going to move the composter down <laughs> to about this level because it is quite high up in the side there right now but we should have enough bone meal to get on with what we want to do here i just need somewhere to put all of the moss after we've exposed the entire thing we're going to take a look at that ore generation graphic and see where we can draw our conclusions see if the ore generation graphic feels accurate to what we've seen so far in this chunk which i'm pretty sure it does at a glance but i would like to see where some of the levels are where we can expect to get the most bang for our buck when we're mining for specific materials like copper. Which levels of the world is it most advantageous to be mining for copper? Likewise, obviously things like diamond are going to come up as well and there's probably a few things to be learned about iron and coal but to be honest I think the majority of iron and coal is going to be up there on the surface near where we started. I also want to talk about these patches of stone and deep slate that seem to be floating around here because there is more to them than meets the eye and we're going to get to that a little bit later. After we're done looking at the ore distribution graphic I think we're going to mine out all of these ores using silk touch so we can take a look in a chest at how many of these ores we were able to acquire from a single chunk and then I think we're going to fortune all of them so we can see exactly how much material we ended up with from all of the ores in here and that includes all of the diamonds and getting all of the copper and iron and everything else as well. So I'm quite looking forward to that, I think that's going to be quite fun. The first thing of course is we need to continue moss mining the chunk and with the enderman farm that we set up in yesterday's episode we should have plenty of opportunity to repair the hoe if we need to but the hoe is looking pretty well repaired from my most recent moss mining session so i'm just going to get to work on this and we'll see you folks on the other side hey folks welcome back so here we are at bedrock it's looking pretty bedrocky down here and i'm pretty sure i have now carved out all of the miscellaneous pieces of deep slate that were down here and in the end we only found one little patch of ore which is these two blocks of deep slate redstone in amongst the bedrock the remainder of this was pretty much just deep slate so as far as ore prospects go i'm fairly certain that we don't need to worry about digging much further down than this why negative 59 but obviously the bedrock here can go down quite far and you do need to be a little careful with this because of course it is possible via crouching under these with elytra to get stuck in an area of bedrock that it's not possible to escape from and the way that works is we end up with an area like this for example this is a really great example of this if i was to crouch and end up in this space i would need ender pearls or something like that to get myself out again or maybe you know some sort of trap door setup that would force me into a crouching position where i could crawl out of this block up here but it's very difficult to escape from a two block high area when you can't break the blocks around you and so it's probably best to make sure you have an ender chest on you with a yeah, ender pearl or two in there in case of emergencies if you're dealing with bedrock like this that's basically the only situation in which i would honestly consider switching this world on to cheats and being able to like use spectator or creative mode to get myself out of there because it's really not worth the hassle looks like i did miss a little bit of deep slate over here so i'm just going to mine out these final pieces but yeah nothing much to write home about below that and above that of course is where we're going to be focusing the majority of our efforts so as you can see one small lava lake here but for the most part give or take a couple of larger cave areas in the higher reaches of the world we didn't encounter any large caverns which means that for the most part this is a pretty complete picture of what we could expect from a single chunk 
of ore. Bear in mind, of course, that this is just a sample. This is not obviously indicative of what you would find in every single chunk. And since we're mining out a mountain here, we end up finding emerald ore in this chunk, which we wouldn't find in other biomes in the world. My netherite hoe has been worn down to nearly a stub. It's a 68 durability, but obviously with unbreaking, it would last a little while longer. However, I'm going to retire it to the ender chest for now, and I'm probably going to mend that at my enderman farm later. For now, though, I think it's time for me to head back to my base and grab a few stacks of scaffolding because we're going to look at this chunk from the top down, comparing it to that ore distribution graphic and see what we've got here in terms of ores. And it takes me five or six rockets just to get out of this chunk in the first place, which is honestly pretty phenomenal. Well, this is definitely the tallest scaffold I've ever built, <laughs> but I found one block over here, and there are probably a few around the perimeter of the chunk, actually. This section over here seems to have a decent amount of them, where it's possible to build all the way from bedrock all the way up to the top of this whole area without getting hit by any blocks without ending up like pillaring up underneath the block and having to start over. So that was a pretty decent job. Now I've got to climb up this scaffolding or I'll probably just fly my way up there because it's a little faster. And would you look at that? We actually managed to get all the way to the top of the chunk with the scaffolding that I had and we ended up right underneath the glass roof. That was every piece of scaffolding that I had. I'm amazed I brought exactly the right amount to get under here. But the cool part about this is we can take out one of these. We'll take this one out as well. We'll look over the top of here like so and I'm gonna get the spyglass out for this. You cannot see the bottom of the chunk because it's that far away. <laughs> the underground layers, you can just about see some of the deep slate that's left behind there. The underground layers are far enough away that my render distance, which I believe is still set to 16 chunks. Yeah, my render distance is 16 chunks. I cannot see the bottom of the world from here. That is mildly terrifying. <laughs> so for the next part of this video, I wanted to show where exactly we're finding each of these ores as we descend through the world looking at the different heights. But I didn't want to do that with the F3 debug information on the screen the entire time. I wanted to do it in a slightly more like viewer friendly kind of way. And so with the help of a data pack from Vanilla Tweaks called Coordinates HUD, which you may have seen some other folks here on YouTube using, we can enable a HUD basically just above the hotbar there that will show us our coordinates. And I may be able to make this slightly bigger by increasing my GUI scale, so this is going to look a little bit weird, but there we go. Now we can hopefully see a little bit better the coordinates that we're standing at each time we look at any particular layer of the world. And I've got the ore distribution graphic on the right hand side of me on my second monitor, you can find this in the video description if you want to download it for yourself and take a look alongside this because I don't want to have it on screen the entire time blocking some of the stuff that we want to be taking a look at. And because the scaffolding is going to be in the way as I descend through it, I'm probably just going to break it a few blocks at a time as I go. So we can take a look at things around, let's start with Y200. Now, according to the ore distribution graph, the peak amount of iron we should be getting is roughly around Y232. So that wasn't even an option on this mountain. We ended up starting our dig down at around Y214, but as you can see, a lot of the mountain just wasn't here to begin with, and this is really where some of the ore distribution graph can't really be explained all that accurately, because unless you have a mountain that has a large area, like enough of a chunk at Y256, you can't really get as accurate a picture as all that, and we were only working with a small portion of terrain, with a lot of it being kind of open to the air. With that said, there is a huge amount of coal that generates around here, and from the ore distribution graph, it shows us that coal just generates in a massive block amount between the maximum height of terrain in the world and about Y140. So, as we can see, huge patches of coal around here, and a little bit of emerald. As we go down a little bit further, emerald really hits its peak at the same place that iron does, and you'll find that there is a reduced amount of emerald as we go further down into the world, provided that you're in a mountain biome, of course. Now that amount of emerald actually tapers off really slowly, and as we go further down, you'll notice that there are a couple of veins of emerald ore that are actually pretty large. There's a piece down there, there's a couple of pieces further down, there's a three vein around here somewhere, which never used to be possible with old ore generation, but is now, and it's super cool to see all of this emerald ore generating within a single chunk. Unfortunately, as we get further down into the world, the amount of emerald ore decreases and can only really be found 
up to 16 levels deep into the deep slate layers. So at negative 16, the emerald ore dwindles down to nothing, and I actually didn't find any deep slate emerald ore in this entire chunk, so my search for that is going to have to continue elsewhere. So at this point, because the terrain was expanding a little bit, we started to get much larger veins of iron, and as we've seen from other mountains around here, it's possible to get huge amounts of iron if you're high up enough in the world, as long as there is terrain for the iron ore to generate in. And I think throughout the world, and the ore distribution graph seems to back this up, you'll actually find more iron in the peaks of mountains than you will at iron levels in caves. So frankly, if you want to go mining for iron, it makes a lot of sense, unless you're looking for a large vein of it in deep slate layers, to go up to mountains instead and find it. The same naturally goes for coal, and here is really where we hit peak coal generation. So if you want coal, I think it's probably best to start mining around Y156 to Y140, because that's the area at which we get linear coal generation from the top of the the world to around Y140, and in addition to that we get a bunch of coal ore generating with reduced air exposure, so once you start digging into the mountain itself, you're going to find a lot more coal, and that's really what we're looking at here. These larger, sprawling veins of coal around here are generating inside the rock itself, and those are not going to be exposed to the surface. If you end up digging out a large area like this, you will find bunches of coal until you get to about Y140, where the linear coal generation from the the top of the mountain tails off. That also coincided with this section of cave here, so we're looking at a section here which doesn't really have a lot of ores in it because a lot of it was open to the air. But even in areas where there was terrain, it seems to have kind of tapered off a little bit. There's still a little bit of iron generating, but the iron is starting to taper off as well, and iron from mountains starts to disappear once we get down to around Y. 80. As you can see, we're already passing by some of the emerald ore that's up there. We've got a few blocks of emerald ore further down, but they occur in ones and twos instead of the larger veins of three and potentially more than that. As we get down to here, we've noticed that a lot of the iron has started to taper off and copper starts to take over around Y112. So right here, standing at 106, we're starting to look at a lot more copper generating and copper really starts to peak around Y48. So as we come down here, you'll notice that we're standing at Y96 right now, and there's a bunch of copper in this area. In fact, what I'm seeing as I go further down here is that we're not really seeing the peak of copper further down there, although there might be a few more copper veins intermingled with the iron. I'm seeing a lot of copper starting to generate around Y90, and in a radius from here, we see four or five or six copper veins, which are actually pretty sizable. Just a little higher than this at Y96 is also the peak of where we find that coal with reduced air exposure. So these veins here are at Y96, those are a pretty accurate illustration of where the game is going to be generating a bunch of coal, which isn't always exposed to the surface. Now as we go further down, once again, this whole section here started to be carved out by a larger cave, so we don't necessarily get the best illustration of what ores would have spawned in this area. But once again, we did have this area here that was full of stone. You can start to see some lapis generating around here, and if we get down to about this height around here, we've just passed sea level, and 48 should be the primary level for copper, so it's interesting that we're standing next to a vein of it, and below this, obviously, it starts to taper off again, but I think what we're seeing here is really just the advantage of there being enough terrain in this area. There's some copper right there, there's a bunch of it around us in the caves, we've got some here, and there's a little bit further down as well. It is worth noting that a lot more copper ore is present in dripstone caves, but it still peaks at around the same level, so if you're hunting for copper ore specifically and you're not going for a huge vein like with the granite generation around it like we have mined out earlier in the series, you're probably best off looking at a dripstone cave around Y48. In fact, around the 48 to 50 mark according to the ore distribution graphic is where you can expect to start finding some of the huge veins of copper to begin with, so you're probably pretty well off looking at the copper around that level. Before we miss this, I want to head back up to around Y80, because around Y80 is where iron from Mount starts to disappear entirely, and as you can see, I think the closest iron vein to where we're standing is that one up there in the wall. So that looks like maybe 10, 12, maybe 15 blocks above us. That's where the last piece of iron generated before 
cave iron generation starts to take over. A small amount of iron will still generate above the surface up to about Y72, so up to about like here. And as we can see over there, there's a little bit of iron generating up high in this cave. But really, iron generation doesn't start to kick in again until below Y56, where once again, it starts to gradually increase until it hits a peak at about Y16. And right here, we're going to pause for a second because on top of this piece of copper ore, I've left a little bit of stone, and you might have been wondering why this is. There's a couple of pieces of stone here, and a couple of pieces of deep slate down there. There's a stone patch right there that I have left, and you might be unclear about why that is. Well, if we take a look at the F3 debug screen for once, this is not something the coordinates HUD can really help me with, you'll see that on the right-hand side under targeted block, it says Minecraft infested stone. This is not actually regular stone. This is silverfish stone, kind of similar to the stone bricks and mossy stone bricks and cracked stone bricks you will find infested with silverfish in strongholds. Now, as I was moss mining out this entire chunk, there were these odd pieces of stone that occasionally wouldn't convert to moss. And at first I just thought, oh weird, there's just one or two of them. I mined them out with my pickaxe as per normal. And because I was using my silk touch pickaxe to do that, I found that nothing in particular happened. They broke at the speed I would have expected them to, and we just picked up the stone and went on our merry way. But if we mine these out with fortune, they create silverfish. <laughs> and silverfish actually hide in the stone of mountain biomes. You cannot collect that stone yourself though. So the stone I just picked up isn't infested stone. It isn't possible to silk touch the blocks with the silverfish in, but I just thought it was an interesting example of the way silverfish could spawn in biomes like this. And the other stone down there is an example of infested stone as well. Not only that, but as we get further down into the deep slate layers, the deep slate that I've left there is infested deep slate. It doesn't generate as stone in the lower levels because that would be a dead giveaway. Instead, there are some patches which will not convert into moss because they are infested deep slate. As we go down into these more solid layers after the area that's kind of been hollowed out by the cave, we do start to see a lot more iron from Y32 downwards, theoretically hitting a peak at Y16. Around Y64, around sea level, we actually start to encounter lapis ore generating as well. And there is a linear amount of lapis generation from sea level all the way down to the bottom of deep slate level. So as you can see from the walls of the cave around us, you'll start to see lapis generating a little bit further down. You'll also start to see a peak of that around Y0 because there is a bunch of extra lapis the world generates without any air exposure whatsoever. So it's always going to be completely surrounded in rock and it's just a matter of either moss mining it out like we've done here or branch mining into it, digging into the cave walls and sometimes you'll find a vein of lapis peeking out of there. The copper ore we have seen generating a little bit higher up starts to dwindle the further down we go and is really going to taper down to Y negative 16, at which point it has become deep slate copper ore, so you'll find a lot less deep slate copper in the world than you will find regular copper, but it's around here that we can expect to find the most iron generating, around Y16. As you can see, we've got a big vein of iron there, a bunch of iron in the walls opposite us, one right here as well, and there's plenty of iron all around us. The game will also generate a small amount of iron at basically any height in the world, but you'll find it starts to dwindle off again around negative 24 in the world, you'll find less iron generating below those depths because other ore starts to take effect at that stage. Our first bits and pieces of gold are also making themselves known. Gold should start to generate in theory around Y32 and move from there on down with a peak at negative 16. Right now it's looking like we're finding a bit more gold above the deep slate layers than below. There's a little bit further down there but I think in this case we just got lucky with this chunk and found a bunch of gold ore right as we started to breach the deep slate layers. At this point as we we can see from looking around, coal is pretty much absent. There is a patch of coal up there that's probably 10 levels above where we are right now, so roughly at Y16, and you really don't see any more coal below that. This proves pretty conclusively, something we knew already, is that coal does not generate in deep slate layers, and the only chance we have at finding deep slate coal ore is to encounter it somewhere around this layer here, around the 7 or 8 mark and down to about Y0, that's the only place at which we could expect to find find any deep slate coal ore whatsoever. But from Y16 on downwards, that's where we can expect to find redstone and diamonds starting to generate. Now in this case, we kind of got unlucky. We didn't find any diamond ore in the stone layers of this whatsoever. In fact, all of the diamond we found actually came from levels below negative six. This one right here is the first vein of diamond that we found. 
There's a bit of redstone above that level, but as it goes, it seems like redstone ore does increase the further down into the world that we go as well. That should be a fairly linear amount up until around Y-32, beyond which there is an increased amount the further down in the world that you go. So you're still going to find a pretty regular amount of redstone regardless of what level of the world you are mining, but typically we're going to find that there's a bunch more redstone if you're mining down in the depths of the world. There's still a bit more iron here, but not nearly as much as we found up high. We're still not seeing any coal, of course, and I'm going to go out into the center of the chunk here, hop onto this block of iron, and we're going to take a look at the diamonds, because the diamonds are really all around us right now. We've got a couple of veins up high. We've got a couple here and there in that cave entrance. There's a little bit more diamond kind of exposed out of the side of that cave there. We've got an eight vein of diamond right here and ones and twos around the place. We've got one down there. We've got some that's down at the level of bedrock and we even have a couple here and there in the walls as well. And I expect the diamond generation is probably the thing that people are going to find the most puzzling about this. And we can probably chalk this up to the fact that we've only mined out one chunk and this is not necessarily a representative sample of what every chunk in the world is going to look like. But if you look around at the walls of this right here, I'm finding that the majority of the diamond we found is actually around the Y-32 level. We've got a bunch of diamonds right there. We've got a few more veins here and there. As we go down, like negative 36 was where we found our largest patch of diamond. And then, of course, there are a few more here and there. There's a couple in the walls there. There's some down there at bedrock level, and there's some just over there embedded in the bedrock. So we're finding a couple of veins of diamonds here and there. Pretty much all of this was completely closed off. So this was all the kind of diamond generation that's supposed to generate with reduced air exposure that you're supposed to find by digging out the chunk, not necessarily in the way that we have done, but in whatever way you find it best to mine. And so as far as the best levels to mine for diamond in this chunk goes, it seems like around negative 36 to about negative 20 would be just as lucrative as mining it down here at the level of bedrock. Of course, we've got four right here, we've got a couple more over there, and we've got one or two in the walls above us, but really, the massive score was that eight vein in the corner over there, which was a lot higher than the lowest possible level of the world that we could go. I'm also not seeing a huge difference between these and some of the veins I encountered while I was caving. The diamond ore still only seems to occur in ones and twos the majority of the time, with veins of eight still being relatively rare. There is this kind of myth going around right now about diamonds having much better chances of larger veins if they're inside the stone and they have reduced air exposure. And while obviously that's probably true in the broader scheme of things, looking at this, it doesn't seem to matter all that much because I've found equally large veins of diamond just by going caving. And if we're branch mining, honestly, the chances of us running into all of these veins of diamond would be relatively slim, partly because we'd be mining lower down in the world, but also just because of the separation between each of these bits of diamond ore. They don't seem to share a common Y coordinate that it's a particularly good place to dig at. I just think we place a little bit too much stock in the idea that the best place to mine for diamonds is the lowest area of the world. Definitely in deep slate layers, I think most likely below Y16, and in theory, the further down in the world you go, the better, but I don't know how much I necessarily believe that, and chances are you'll find a lot more diamonds just by digging around wherever you feel like it. But once again, this really only goes for the representative sample of ore distribution that we found through this one chunk, and I think you're going to find a little bit more conclusive results if we set up branch mines at different heights of the world. So so if we end up doing that in future, it's going to take a lot of work because it involves mining through deep slate and there's not really a particularly fast way to do that. But if we end up mining through different layers of the world, we'll end up with a much better picture of which Y height is the best for mining diamonds. So after that strange revelation, here comes the fun part. It's time to take down every single ore in this chunk. And I'm almost sad about that. I think it's it looks pretty cool with all of the ores exposed like this, but I do genuinely want to see how much we've got here. And... I'm probably going to say it's not going to take up more than a double chest, 
So I might grab one of the chests that's been storing all of the stone and, you know, miscellaneous bits and pieces that I picked up here when I wasn't able to turn everything into moss, and we'll add that to a big chest down here and figure out how much we've got of everything. But I'm fairly certain that <laughs> there's at least a couple of stacks of coal and iron in here, probably a couple more, and we'll see what else we have, not to mention the deep slate and the regular ores aren't going to stack together. So no time like the present, let's get up here with our silk touch pickaxe and let's get every single ore block torn out of this chunk. Okay, we are done, or at least we're done, save this small patch of infested deep slate, which I'm going to leave there for now and probably not do anything with, frankly. You could maybe move it with pistons, but I don't really see the need. <laughs> I'm just going to prank myself in this world. But I've gotten rid of everything in this chunk, aside from the obsidian as well, of course, and it all fits very neatly into the contents of a single chest. So I didn't need to expand the chest at all. We have a decent look at all of our supplies here. I'm just gonna rearrange a couple of things so it's grouped up in slightly better quantities and you all can see what's going on here. So we have nearly nine full stacks of coal ore and by the way, sidebar, don't ever do this. <laughs> I mean, by all means, take down a chunk with moss, but collect the ores as you go, because that took a lot of flying around. I've used up half the durability on my elytra, nearly a full stack of fireworks, and it was really a pain to make sure I got every single ore without it all, like, falling onto one of these ledges or something, or falling onto some of the other blocks that were in here and potentially despawning. I meticulously collected every single piece. And I'm just now noticing that I left out the redstone that is down here, and we can't forget that, so I might as well just grab this while I'm down here and make sure that there weren't any other blocks that I hadn't mined out. Nope, looks like that's everything, okay? Honestly, you think you're done with the project and it just keeps getting bigger and bigger, so there we go. Uh, ignore the deep slate and the stone in here, those were the infested stone that I took down, but, you know, we can, largely speaking, ignore those. So we've got 20 deep slate diamond ore, we've got 9 regular emerald ore, we've got, yeah, close to, you know, just over 20, I suppose, gold ore between the two of them, a similar amount of lapis, a decent amount of redstone, that's almost half a stack between those, 27 total, that's not too bad. About three stacks of copper ore, about the same of iron ore, give or take a few, and it's all looking quite good. I think as far as taking down the entire chunk, this is really not the kind of thing you would do expecting to get ores, because this whole thing has probably taken me about... I want to say 10 hours total of my time to do. And yes, of course, there are still veins off to the sides that I didn't include in this because they aren't technically part of the chunk. They are part of the adjoining chunks. And I will be coming back and collecting these, probably scaffolding up since I don't really have a ledge to stand on. But all in all, that was the contents of this chunk. I gotta say 20 diamond ore feels pretty good, I gotta say. I think in previous world generation, it was only the case that you got roughly one vein of diamond per chunk. So typically that would be like eight diamond ore if you got an eight vein and you were lucky. 20, on the other hand, assumes that there have been multiple veins of diamond and especially, like I said, as we go deeper and deeper into the world, larger veins of diamond ore is sort of what we would expect. So ultimately, I think that's pretty good. The last thing I'm going to do with this episode, and I'm gonna do it after I have gotten some sleep, is to do what I promised to do and fortune all of these ores as well, to see what exactly the product would be if we broke all of this stuff down using a fortune pickaxe, except for the emerald ore. That is, <laughs> that is going in the ender chest. That one's going in probably my loot box here, actually, because I have one emerald ore in here already, the one that we collected from up there. This was also my first time gathering deep slate copper ore, I realized, because I've really not really bothered with it after having gathered so much copper from that huge vein. But everything else, we will be fortuning, and I'm going to just stack it all up into a giant pile in the center of the chunk here, so we can see it all before we mine it all. I'm going to try and lay this out kind of like a bar graph, I guess, so that we can see the quantities here and have them represented in quite how much of each material there is. Oh, and and that alone is all the coal. <laughs> We're through the coal, the iron, and the copper now. Let's see that the other towers are going to be a lot smaller than these. And there we go. Take it all in, and we'll probably take a screenshot of that as well. <laughs> it's a little bit hard to read with all of the deep slate around behind this, but it's now time to take all of this down with fortune and see how much we're left with at the end of it. I think I'm going to be turning it all into resource blocks because the coal alone, if we left it as single items, is probably going to fill up close to a single chest. I reckon we should just get straight into it and we'll start over here with the diamonds. Okay, and the final blocks of coal are down and that proved pretty fruitful and very, very interesting to see the results of this because overall, 
It fits quite neatly into a chest this time around, and in fact, surprisingly, or perhaps not so surprisingly, the thing we got the most of was copper, and it's mainly because copper drops so many raw items when you mine it with Fortune 3. Compared to coal, which only drops between 1 and 4 items, same as iron, copper is going to drop a whole bunch more, and so that means we were able to make more blocks of raw copper than we were blocks of coal, although something tells me I'm not going to be running out of coal for a little while. The iron, by comparison, slims down to uh, like less than a stack of raw blocks so I really do think if you're going mining for iron mining out a chunk like this probably wouldn't have occurred to you anyway but you'll get a fair amount of it from higher up in the world in mountains skip ahead to a couple of other mountains or maybe go find a huge iron vein if you want a whole lot more of that better yet, set up an iron farm. But of course, the precious resources over here are looking okay as well. And don't be deceived by the fact that there are not all that many blocks in here. The blocks of redstone are obviously going to break back down into nine redstone dust. We ended up with a few stacks of redstone from that. Of course, I didn't convert the diamonds into blocks because it always looks nicer when you feel like you have more diamonds. We got 43 diamonds out of all of the ores we gathered there, which pretty much evens out to about double the amount of ores. I believe we had 20. So Fortune 3 usually gives you a about 2.2 for every ore on average so yeah that's more or less working out at a decent ratio for for fortune lapis is going to give us a bunch because sometimes lapis drops like 32 per block if you're mining it with fortune so that's ultimately going to work out in our favor and overall it doesn't seem like all that much considering all the work we had to do to get these materials but remember this was never about just getting the ores it was about seeing what exactly the anatomy of a chunk was when we strip out all of the other blocks and yes i did finally manage to demolish that little patch of infested deep slate over there i think we could maybe double our diamonds if we got cheeky and mined out the diamond veins from the neighboring chunks because occasionally there were like ones and twos of the ores that just got left in the wall after i took down the ones that were actually part of this chunk but I was trying to be as scientific about this as I possibly could. I am going to be grabbing those after the episode is over. And that's where we are going to leave it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed this look at the anatomy of a chunk. I think it's kind of interesting to take a look at exactly what's under your feet every once in a while. And hopefully you found this interesting. Once again, though, if you do do this, take down the oars as you go. It's going to save you a lot of time. Thank you so much for watching. My name has been Pixorifs. Please don't forget to leave a like on this video if you enjoyed it. Subscribe if you want to see more. And I'll see you folks soon. Take care. Bye for now.